remember standing at the top of this mountain, watching this whole village gathered around us. There's one mother holding this small child, had to be one years old, and he was super shy, and he kept hiding his face underneath this blanket that she was holding him in. And, um, and his eyes were so adorable and so lit up. I kept wanting him to poke his face out. And, um, and he finally turned and his nose was just covered in sores. Vitamin A is, is a vitamin that I thought existed in cereals to make interested mothers purchase products. I didn't understand until this week that vitamin A actually has some type of real world value. The families here are really huge. The minimum I have seen in most villages is eight children per woman. Their hope is that if we have at least eight children, one of them will survive and take care of us when we become old, take care of our farms, of our cattle, because they've never seen children remain healthy. So their understanding is that children will fall sick, small children will fall sick and may die and that's why we need to have more children. But now with vitamin A coming in, there's this completely different perspective on child survival. How many people live in India? Uh, about 1.2 billion. Why out of that 1.2 billion are you here in Nagaland focused on vitamin A? It seems like there are a lot of other things you could be doing. Yes. Um, as a doctor, I was trained to cure diseases. But uh, I realized that once the patient comes to a hospital or once a child who's sick comes to a hospital, it's already too late. And so we have children dying of diarrhea in India. We have children dying of pneumonia. Of, of common cuffs and colds, of, of worms, you know. Undernutrition is a huge problem in India. Shilpa is our country doctor and she's the, she runs the program for all of India. She lives in Bombay, but she's already been to Nagaland five times and she loves it here, so she's very committed to this program. So when I was first working in India, and we went to this hospital, this doctor named Dr. Doshi, we were touring the hospital, and I remember on the second floor in the last room, there was a young dad, and he was probably 21 years old, and um, he had a 16-month-old son in his arms. And I remember looking at the boy, and the boy was, he was completely blind in both eyes. And I knew it was vitamin A deficiency, and I knew that had we been there six months earlier, it would not have happened. Any child who goes blind because of vitamin A deficiency dies within a period of 12 months. Really? What Dr. Shilpa said, it's like, it's, just, it's not acceptable. That's just that, no, that cannot happen. At least while I'm around, I'll, I'll just commit to doing everything I can to reaching every kid. I don't want to get there six months late again. <laughs> I want to get there six months earlier. <laughs> it's not rocket science, you know? It's a simple intervention, but reaching the children is the hardest part, the most challenging part. This is the Hollywood stunt driver in Nagaland. <laughs> Look at us all celebrating. We get we get ten feet up the road. It's gonna all happen again. <laughs> Never a dull moment. I know it's not like things could have gone horribly wrong. <laughs> oh God. What does it take to get to Nagaland? Five flights, three countries, 
16 hours of driving, 48 hours of travel, three days. You know, you're on some of the roughest road conditions on the planet, going through the mountains with an army escort, and before you know it, you're holding on for dear life, trying not to fall off the side of a mountain. How did they greet us when we first came here? Welcome to the end of the world? Is that Welcome to the end of the world. I don't think there's anyone that makes it out this far and has any question about whether they were supposed to be here or not. This is not an easy place to reach. You don't get here by accident. How many, um, how many cars annually roll off the mountain? How many cars roll like fall off the mountain annually oh, every year? That I don't know. <laughs> when we rolled into the first village, watching this whole village gathered around us. To see all these people do an entire dance and ritual just for a few people to show up. It's kind of declares how important this has been in their community. So when you, uh, so uh, Jeff told me an interesting story. He said that in your office, and I, I stepped in there for a second, but he said in your office that you have uh, an old photo of you with hair down to your waist. Is that true? <laughs> there are some photos of me with hair down to my waist. So so how long ago? How old were you? I was um, well from my teens, my late teens to my twenties, uh, somewhere in my twenties for quite a while. I had pretty long hair and. Uh, Lived on a commune, and it was like, well, uh, that seems like a lot more fun than college. <laughs> <laughs> it still seems like a great idea. <laughs> and this other thing was going on on the West Coast that would seem really cool. And the people were starting to live in teepees and build their own homes and grow their own food, and that just seemed like an amazing thing. And so we just started this, this idea that we were going to have a farm, that we were going to have a commune, and try to find another way to live try to find a way to kind of work with people and live with people and and that led me into the natural products industry. So between 94 and 2004, we were probably reaching at that point maybe like a million and a half, two million kids. And then in 2006, we jumped to four and a half million. From 2006 to 2013, we went from four and a half to 30 million kids. The 
these kids are worth it. You know, these, these women are amazing. We have incredible partners here. And, you know, they're really trying to make a difference in these children's lives. And we're seeing a difference. You know, we're seeing kids are healthier and kids are doing better in school. And they're just being much more vital. We're showing up in villages and seeing mothers that are flocking out of their houses to meet once every six months to make sure that their kids will just be a little bit healthier, a little bit safer, a little bit stronger, maybe just survive. It's not making sure they play sports better, it's making sure that their kids are alive in 10 years, that their kids aren't blind, to make sure that that baby heals properly to make sure that this time next year, his face isn't covered in sores. If we can't reach a child under five with two doses of vitamin A a year, um, what's the point of doing anything else? Let's do the basics first. You know, let's try to prevent vitamin A deficiency. Some people you ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And that, that sort of idea is just beyond their, their comprehension. But when you remove the survival factor, when it's not a question of, I just want my kid to grow up and be alive and be healthy. And it's more of, oh, well, I know they're going to grow up and be healthy. Removing that, that question of survival opens up an entire world. You know, we always think about our own stories. And we think about what kind of purpose, what kind of impact our experiences have on us. You know, I'm going to India, what is that gonna mean for my life? What, how is that gonna translate to a story I tell one day? We're kind of lost in our own stories. And it's very difficult to step outside of that and think that maybe I'm not here for my story, maybe I'm playing a supporting role in the stories of so many people here, in the memories of so many kids here. You know, I think it's that thing that is important to sort of take a step back from our own personal experiences and a step back from what is this doing for me, what am I getting from this. Maybe I'm not the lead character, 